Well, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, happy Vartanans Day, uh, the Holy Vartanians Day, uh, whom we celebrate this day. It's always on Thursdays. It's a movable feast, but it always happens to be on a Thursday, and which Thursday depends on when Easter is. Everything is calculated according to Easter. So, for that reason, I also celebrate my name day, because Haig is reckoned to be one of the 1,036 holy martyrs. So, happy name day to me as well. What better way of celebrating than giving the first lecture of a course of ancient Armenian? So, I will start by giving you a little taste, which might not be what perhaps you expected. Yes, <laughs> Basan <laughs> Եվ եհեղ իմատանի անդը սաստկություն նենգության չարության յուրո եվ սկամս իշխելու ամեն այն էինց։ Մի եվ ետ մատանի հացել զամենեսին ընտլծով բրնարար տերության յուրո։ Մի աստ մի ոջ է ազատ երկիրկ Dashan Verchin Martkan Yevelvats, Yelandem Banakats Mordoro, Yevar Storoti Plerin and Vetro, Nokamartian, Vasnazatutian, Vichnash. Anyway, so that is a little taste of what classical Armenian can sound like. That was, of course, the Lord of the Rings, Der Madanyats, when translated into ancient Armenian. And I'm not, of course, suggesting that you should learn ancient Armenian in order that you can see the Lord of the Rings in ancient Armenian. But uh, it is, I think, a, a sort of rather uh, interesting uh, little thing that has been done and they've done it quite well uh, so that's uh, something different from the usual church literature or liturgical material that you uh, you typically come across now i have been a little imprecise i said ancient armenian and the moment ago i said classical armenian um, it's not exactly the same thing I prefer to refer, refer to our course as being ancient Armenian rather than classical Armenian, even though classical Armenian is what you hear much more often in English when they refer to Staro Armenstina or Krapar in Armenian. Uh, the difference is this, that strictly speaking, classical Armenian is Tasagan Hairen, and it refers to a very narrow 
window on the timeline uh, a kind of golden age, Vosketar. And uh, particularly the Mkhitaryist fathers in Vienna, that's a monastic order that has branches in Venice on the island of San Lazaro and in the center of Vienna also. The Vienna branch have been very, very rigorous in cultivating this strictly defined classical Armenian and really they define it as being the period between 407 and 450. So this is such a tiny window that what comes immediately after it is uh, post-classical and that only goes according to 572 according to their definition. Um, they uh, refer to part of that as being a Silver Age and uh, uh, that's confusing because mostly in Armenian literature the Silver Age is considered to be the period from the 11th to the 13th centuries, in other words, literature produced in Cilicia, but not according to the Vienna Mechitarist father's definition. And then there's a copper century. You can see that the value of the currency is going down more and more from 572 to 603, which is uh, the sort of Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic age, um, which the Mechitarists of Vienna tend to consider to be a sort of dark age, a period of decline, uh, it's when uh, ancient Armenian uh, started uh, using the syntax and the structure of Greek texts that were being translated into Armenian and philosophical terms were created in Armenian that were calques. Calc, C-A-L-Q-U-E. It's when you have a compound word and you translate it to a different language by translating the two bits individually and then sticking them together. And that is indeed what some Armenian translators were doing, uh, even in the 8th century. So that's the Hellenistic period. However, what we're going to do is not going to be only the Armenian uh, that was that is, uh, as it were, attested by the literature between 407 and 450. We're going to cover the entire period of ancient Armenian. My use of ancient Armenian uh, as a term is also problematic because you would think it is reasonable to associate ancient Armenian with ancient Armenia, which takes us to a much earlier period. But that's not my intention. My intention is to refer to the fact that this is not modern Armenian, it's not middle Armenian, but it's the classical language, but not the classical period of it defined in this strict uh, definition. Uh, and these definitions are rather arbitrary and inexact, and the Mechitarist fathers of Vienna particularly have used rather uh, colorful and emotive language uh, referring to the third quarter of the fifth century as a time when the sky was cloudy, the world was noisy, and Armenia was in decline, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a very subjective way of looking at the language. And this is the church in Vienna of the Mechitarist monks who have upheld this tradition of very strictly wishing to cultivate the classical language defined through this very strict and rather narrow definition. And you will find that uh, the equivalent of the Latin or Greek, Kyrie eleison, which in Armenian is derva ormia, which is a very well-known formula, even modern Armenians sometimes say it, Lord have mercy, derva ormia, but in Vienna, in services, they do not say der Vormia, they say der Vormiats. Because during the classical period, as evidenced by those first few writers, 
Verbs that end in E, such as vohormim, which means I have mercy, um, they take the imperative second person singular with a t at the end. So, strictly speaking, it should be der vohormiats, if we're going to say it using the classical way. This is just a little detail. If you happen to be in this beautiful church during a service, don't be surprised that they say der Vormiats and not der Vormia. But there is an element of anachronism because the Armenian breviary, the book of Armenian prayers, had things added to it until quite a late period. And even if we look at the Armenian hymnal, which became entirely closed at around the 14th century. Uh, you have a hymn where there is Naya Imez, Naya Imez, which is sung at weddings, usually, where you, you have Naya, as in Vormia, and not Nayats, even though the ending is in E, the verb is Naim. And yet there's a late hymn by St. Nerses the Gracious, Nerses Shinorhali, where we have the older form, Nayats. So the whole thing is a melange. And for the purposes of our course, we're not going to focus very much on the distinction between what is classical and what isn't. Occasionally, I will tell you that such and such a form is more common in older sources and such and such a form is a little later but we're not going to uh, engage in uh, stylistic composition so i'm not going to say write a paragraph in the style of Mofses Horenazi, for example in fact this course does not involve translating into armenian it involves understanding Armenian texts and translating them into English or Czech or whatever you want. Why learn the language? Okay. Follow Lord of the Rings in ancient Armenian is not perhaps the strongest reason. One argument is aesthetic. I would say it is a very beautiful language and so it makes us more human and it gives us pleasure to look into it a little bit more deeply. And there are a lot of beautiful texts that were written in this language, and it is always a much more intense pleasure to be able to enjoy these things in the original language in which they were written. Another reason is that if, for example, you're interested in all sorts of things, including Jewish philosophy, for example, we have some texts, such as a lot of things by Philo of Alexandria, who was a very important Jewish philosopher and theologian who wrote in ancient Greek. We have a lot of texts that did not survive in the original Greek, but they exist only in ancient Armenian translation. So, if you're interested in Jewish philosophy, if you're interested in Christian theology, if you're interested in particular things, uh, you will need to know ancient Armenian if, if you want to find out as much as you can about the author you're studying. Yet another reason, if you're interested in learning modern Armenian, you will find that ancient Armenian is a very powerful binding force between the two main dialects of modern Armenian, the Eastern dialect and the Western dialect. I would go so far as to say that if you learn ancient Armenian, you will find it very easy to learn both Eastern Armenian and Western Armenian. So, aesthetic beauty, yes, I have said. Euphonious quality, it may be a matter of taste. But irrespective of whether or not you pronounce it using Western pronunciation or Eastern pronunciation, it really does sound very beautiful. And there is one other thing I would like to say. Oh, yes, the first-rate literature. Very, very true. And I would argue that it is actually not a dead language. 
It is a living language in the sense that you can go and hear it being spoken and being sung in most parts of the world. It is sufficient just to walk into an Armenian church, whether in Prague, Kostel Svateo Ducha, where I was singing earlier today, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, the whole of Europe, most of Asia, in, including the Far East, there are Armenian churches in India. Um, so wherever you are, you will hear the language being spoken, being sung. So in that sense, it is not a dead language. And in fact, it's a marvelous advantage if you're going to learn the language. I strongly recommend going to a church and having your ear filled with a lot of phrases and sentences, some of which will linger in the mind. And you will find that to be a marvelous advantage. When you're trying to remember a point of grammar, you will not have to go and open a book. You will just remember a particular phrase that you have heard sung, and that will give you the key. So in that sense, it is a living language. Yeah, OK, it's not a living language in the sense that when you're going to have a pivo with your friends, it would be rather eccentric to communicate with them in ancient Armenian. You could. Uh, there is a lady in Armenia, Lucine something or other, um, who writes poems in ancient Armenian, and at a conference she stood up and made a speech in ancient Armenian, uh, which I enjoyed very much indeed. Uh, but that is very much the exception. There are still occasions where um, in Oxford and Cambridge, for example, if you get an honorary degree, a speech may be made in Latin, not in ancient Greek, unfortunately, but in Latin. So such limited uses uh, may also be encountered. Now, if you happen to have Armenian origin, which is the case with Inga and with Arpine, but not, I think, with Marek and Martin, um, it gives a marvelous sense of continuity with your ancestors. There's an unbroken chain. You see, particularly if you go to a church, the prayers that you are hearing or maybe saying yourself, or the hymns that are being sung, they are the same ones that were being used in the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century. So there's a, an unbroken chain that gives a sense of continuity. You don't get that feeling when you go into an Anglican church or some Protestant church, and you find that everything is being done in a modern way. Whereas in the case of ancient army, and really these are the same words, the same sentences that were used by your father and grandfather and his father and grandfather and grandmother and so on and so forth. And that, that makes it rather poignant. I don't know, I find it rather emotionally potent. And it's also, I think, a valid motivation. Now, how are we going to work? I will introduce you to little sentences. Well, first, we have to look at the alphabet. Now, for anyone who does not know the Armenian alphabet, for example, I think Martin probably does not yet know the Armenian alphabet, so the first thing is we need to learn the alphabet because that is a prerequisite and that we need to use so that we start reading little words and reading short sentences. So I will be giving you a little bit of grammar. There's no way of avoiding that and we need to systematize things up to a point. But this is not really a very grammar-driven course. There will be grammar, and we shall be rigorous when we need to be. But I will always try to reinforce the grammar by giving you a lot of examples. And I will try to take those examples from real texts as far as possible. Usually the New Testament, but increasingly when we advance the Older Testament as well, historians as well, 
even humorous stories involving animals, bears and foxes and crows and eagles and things. A little bit like Aesop, but not Aesop. There are Armenian writers, Mkhitar uh, Kosh, for example, and, and, and others, Vartanai uh, So that we shall do. So there will be a bit of grammar and a lot of sentences, a lot of practice, reading again and again, and then you will find that without having to try very much, you'll be able to remember certain things. So our sources will be, um, amongst other things, the Armenian Bible, the Armenian hymnal. From time to time, I will sing you particular sentences. This is how you teach modern languages often. You use pop songs. We don't have pop songs in ancient Armenian, but we have a lot of hymns and psalms and things. And I will sing you. And you may find that when you remember the tune that I have sung, you remember the words as well, and you remember a point of grammar without really having to try hard. And liturgical texts, things that if you walked into a church, you would hear and they will be more and more familiar. There are also riddles by St. Narcissus the Gracious. I am like this, and I have four feet, and I have this, and I have that. What am I? You know, that kind of riddle. These he wrote to educate children, but they're very useful for teaching ancient Armenian uh, to students. And Fables by Vartanai Kekci and Mkhitar Kosh, and some of them are really very funny. Ancient Armenians really did have a very strong sense of humor, and that we can use as well. Now, a word about textbooks. The way I learned ancient Armenian was through the series of textbooks written by my own teacher, uh, the late Archbishop Zare has never young of blessed memory. Um, but these textbooks, three volumes, they were written to be used by people who already know Western Armenian. So I cannot use them as they are for the purpose of teaching a course to people who may not know Armenian at all in any form or who do not know Western Armenian. Now, my good friend, the emeritus abbot, Father Paulus Kojanyan, Boros Kojanyan, published a textbook in two different versions, one in Eastern Armenian, one in Western Armenian, uh, focusing on the classical Armenian, in other words, that defined in that narrow sense. It's an excellent book, very focused, very concentrated, but still readable, but again, depending on which version you have, it assumes that you already know Western Armenian or Eastern Armenian, as the case may be. But I've used it in this course. I've obtained a lot of useful examples from this book. The late Minasyan wrote an excellent textbook, very strong on grammar, published in 1976, which I find very useful but again, it is written in modern Western Armenian. However, I believe that he has a French version of the same, published in 1976. I haven't been able to find that, so I've never seen it. If I could get a scan, I'd make it available to you. So if any of you happens to have it, please do make it available. If you find it somewhere in a second-hand bookshop or eBay or something like that, do get it. It's probably very, very good. Um, now, in many ways, I follow his approach, but he is very grammar-based. So there's a chapter about a particular form, and then another chapter about another form, and so on and so forth. Whereas that's not how I proceed. So I suspect you would use the book if you can get the French version of it, for reference. And there's one other difference. He is very systematic and he tries to generalize and systematize and derive very, very general and powerful rules, but to apply them to particular words, for example, when you're conjugating verbs, 
you have to have a lot of special cases and rules to cope with these. I try to do things in a simpler way, even though it is less general and all-embracing my way. The late Professor Thompson, his book, which has been reprinted three times, I have the book, I use it myself, and I've got a scan of it, but it's very dry. If you happen to be studying general linguistics, for example, this book will be very good for you. But it's not something I would recommend for you to use to teach yourself. Let's put it that way. A kind of Bible of ancient Armenian is that by the Venetian father, Arsen Pakraduni. It's huge and it's almost comprehensive. But it is written in ancient Armenian, so you've got to know ancient Armenian to be able to read the book. So it's something you use for reference purposes. I do have a scan of it, but I fear you would get lost in it if I sort of made it available to you now. Uh, but I do look at it from time to time when I need to check things, and it's quite a formidable and very valuable volume. What, however, is very useful, even though it's very old, the first edition was published, I think, sometime before 1821, because Byron died in 1821, I think, or 1823. Lord Byron, when he was in Venice, he went to San Lazaro to learn ancient Armenian. And together with his teacher, Father Harutyun Avkerian, or in the Europeanized uh, uh, form, Father Pascal Aucher, they wrote a textbook together in English of ancient Armenian. This textbook is quite small. It's not comprehensive. It doesn't try to include everything, but it is excellent. It's very down to earth, simply explained, user friendly. I have a scan of the 1873 edition and I, I always send it to my students because it's very useful for reference purposes. And, uh, you know, nothing has changed. Whatever is there, it's correct. But you will find that there are some things that are not covered in the book, because it's a small book. But because it is a small book, unlike the Pakraduni, you don't get lost in it when you're looking for something. So it's excellent. I recommend it. If you are a Latin enthusiast and a bit of an antiquarian and you like those things, there's a book by Johannes Joachim Schroeder, written in Latin, published in 1711. Not sure now if it was Amsterdam or Venice or Rome. Not sure now. Anyway, it's a very interesting book. It also includes a section on music. Uh, and it's in Latin. So you can use it if you want. I have a scan of it. But what is rather funny is that the last section is a sort of conversation guide for the modern language of that time and of that milieu. That's the beginning of the 18th century. And that is really very comical because it's very vernacular. It's the common language. And he was, t he was talking to... I don't know, servants and people working in restaurants and uh, ordinary people. And he was faithfully reproducing how they spoke. And there are a lot of foreign words, Persian words, Turkish words. It's not a very purified Armenian. So the first part of the book is rigorous and it teaches you ancient Armenian via Latin. But the last bit is like a tourist's guide for conversations. You've gone to a shop, you want to buy something. How you should have it, have, how you should uh, conduct the conversation. It's dialogue between two people. So that's rather amusing. Um, to come back to more modern times, Meillet was a French linguist uh, who was very, very important. And 
I think there's a reprint of some of his work published in 1913, in 1980. I don't have it. But if you see it somewhere, get it. There's Jensen, and there's probably the greatest Armenian linguist, uh, born in Constantinople, but he died in Sovietized Armenia, Rachia Ajarian. He wrote quite a comprehensive and more modern treatment, but you need to know Armenian to be able to use the book. And I think it's more than a single volume. I don't have it. And more and more textbooks have been mushrooming recently. I would say, use the scan of the Lord Byron one of 1873. And apart from that, I will be giving you everything that you need. So you don't need any other books. But what I will teach you to use is the so-called Three Archimandrites Dictionary, which is now online. It was published in Venice in two large volumes in 1836. One of the volumes was 1836. The other one was a little before or a little after. There was a much, much, much shorter version in a single volume. Don't use that. Use the proper one. Even the proper version in two big volumes, which is now online, so you just type in the word and it immediately gives you a scan of the page where that word is found. It's excellent. It's on the Nairi server. I'll give you the address later on. Uh, but even this is much smaller than what the Venetian monks wanted to publish. It's heartbreaking when you read the preface. They had a much bigger version of it, but they could not get the money to get it published. Remember, getting something published today in relative terms is much less expensive with modern technology than it was in the first half of the 19th century. So with a heavy heart, they had to abbreviate it. And that's what we have. The two volume version, the full version, is itself much more abbreviated compared to what they originally did. And every time I go to San Lazaro, I speak to the monks and I say, has no one found the original manuscript of the full version? I'd like to photograph it or scan it. And they're not sure if it exists, and I don't know. What a pity. But what we do have is an extremely valuable tool. So when you look up a word in the three Archimandrites dictionary, Yeritz Vartabedats Parkirk, the proper title is Nor Parkirk Haigazian Lesvi, a new lexicon of the Armenian language. Um, you find the word you're looking for. Then it will give you, if it is a noun, its declined form, so that you can immediately know how it is declined, how every case, kajdi pat, is formed. Then you will have the different meanings of the word with sentences from ancient authors giving you examples of the use of the word and it will give you the Greek, ancient Greek and Latin equivalents as well in most cases. So as you can imagine this is something that is extremely useful and in my own work I use it almost every day. So it's online and you can use it. So the Lord Byron textbook which is small and manageable, the slides that I will be presenting to you and this dictionary will be enough for our purposes. This is my late teacher, Archbishop Aznavorian, whose three-volume course is very modern and extremely easy to use and user-friendly. But as I said, it already presupposes you know Western Armenian. This is my good friend, Father Paulus in Vienna. Um, I went to him a couple of years ago with a question because I, I'm, I've been doing some translation and I had a difficulty with one phrase and I read it to him and I said, what does he think? He waved his head and he said, Tasagance, it's not classical. You know, it's not classical. It was written 
after uh, 470, what do you expect? Uh, very nice chap. Lord Byron. Ah, yes, this is, this is the uh, Schroeder. Um, I think there is a copy of this book in Prague at the Narodni Knjovna. Perhaps not, no, no. But I had this book in Prague at the Clementinum when I organized my exhibition of early Armenian books in 2016. So we had one here on display. But the scan of it is available. And if you're interested, I can send it to you. You can also download it from the pages of the National Library of Armenia. And this is Hrachia Ajarian, the great Armenian linguist. I mentioned the lexicon of the three Archimandrites. This is San Lazaro in Venice. This is where the, those three monks together wrote this marvelous dictionary. Two of them had already passed away when it was published. Only the third one was still alive in 1836 and 1837. That round building, by the way, is where the manuscripts are kept and I've spent many hours there, or rather many hours in this little bridge where I've photographed manuscripts because there's good light from those windows, you see. So this is San Lazaro in Venice. Well worth visiting. Don't go to Venice without visiting San Lazaro. Um, and the founder of the Mkhitarist order was Mkhitar of Sebast, a visionary and someone who uh, will be encountered many times in Armenian studies, whether it's history or philology or language. And these are the Mkhitarist congregation in uh, Venice with some of their colleagues in Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, two of the people in this photograph are no longer with us. Um, Father Hofsepp, very nice man. He passed away uh, three years ago. I was present at his funeral. So, we will start with the alphabet and with transliteration. I will try not to go too fast because we need to allow any of you who might not know the Armin alphabet a week in which to learn it. If you don't learn the Armin alphabet, you will not be able to understand anything uh, after that. So that's the most crucial thing. And the reason I've given a very detailed introduction is to make good use of the time. But without giving you sentences, before you know the letters, you cannot go beyond. So that's the first thing I will give you. And then we will look at the verb to be. Personal pronouns, a bit of vocabulary, plenty of examples and exercises before we go on to other things. Just an outline. Ignore the numbering of the lectures. It's different if we have an hour and a half. It's different if we've got three hours. And I will not plow through this material and leave dead bodies uh, in my wake. We will do things as slowly or as fast as is needed so that you are all on board. But the next block, let us say, involves looking at possessive adjectives, looking at the plural, and looking at the indicative mood, which is the main mood, in the present tense, see how we can negate verbs, and then look at some nouns, the nominative and the accusative, these are the easiest cases. Um, and again, plenty of vocabulary, examples, exercises. Much of the course will be done by analyzing and reading and translating sentences. When the course becomes more advanced, we will be able to look at real passages from real authors. But that will be a good deal later. Demonstrative pronouns and articles, their declension, the imperfect indicative, some prepositions. 
pluralia tantum nouns. This is something you can get in other uh, languages as well. In Czech, there is something like the pomnožne číslo as well. But pluralia tantum, strictly speaking, is this. In Armenian, you have some words that are plural in form, but which semantically, in other words, in terms of their meaning, can be either singular or plural, but grammatically they look like and behave exactly as nouns in the plural, even if they didn't mean plural. And in their meaning, they might be plural or they might be singular. You cannot tell except from the context. More prepositions. And then the aorist. That's the first big challenge. But it's something that is very rewarding. Once we've done the aorist, we really have the tools to deal with the future as well. And in fact, one of the two subjunctives. Again, vocabulary examples exercise and probably this will actually keep us busy for this semester, I imagine. Now, this is if we want to learn things properly. The other way that I could do is try and give you an overview of the whole language and tell you also about other, much more advanced things. So I will give you, if I do that, I would give you an idea of the whole of the language, but you would not actually be able to understand very much. That's something we might do if we find out that after this semester I will not be teaching you anymore, so then there is a strong argument in favor of giving you a lot of tools for things you might be able to learn in the future on your own, and that would be a different approach. But that's not how this course has been planned. This course has been planned, and in the past I've taught it, over five semesters. And so it continues with declensions of different types, more and more prepositions, the two ways in which we can express the future in ancient Armenian, which in effect are like two subjunct subjunctives, the aorist subjunctive and the future subjunctive. Um, the past participle, which is very important and very flexible, very versatile in ancient Armenian, um, and uh, so that's the outline of the course. So, any questions so far? Uh, let us pause the recording, Marku, if we may. I mentioned Meyer, I should like to mention Hübschmann as well, because we're going to talk in a moment about the hübschmann meyer system of transliteration. Hübschmann was a German gentleman, very fine linguist, and he was the first formally to prove that contrary to what had been thought until then, Armenian actually is not a branch of Iranian, but is in fact an independent branch of Indo-European, parallel to languages such as Greek or the group of Slavonic languages, Western or Eastern, and others. So this was proven by Hübschmann. Meyer I've already mentioned, and it's interesting because he had fingers in all sorts of pies, this chap. And uh, I think that Ajarian studied with Meyer, by the way. His doctorate was uh, entitled Research on the Use of the Genitive Accusative in Old Slavonic. Um, and there's a system of transliteration that is known as Hübschmann Meyer. Uh, just one other thing before I introduce the alphabet and mention what those letters are and what the standard way of transliterating is. Um, the Armenian alphabet now consists of 38 letters. But 
up until Cilician times, we're talking about roughly speaking 11th century, there were 36 letters. Two of them were added during the Cilician times. They are O, as in as uh, as a sort of round O, as in a Latin O. Until the adoption of this new letter, O would be written in Armenian as Au. Um, and the other one is F, Fe. Before its adoption, Armenians would use Pur, which looks like a Greek Phi, like a Greek Phi. So, now traditionally the Armenian alphabet was invented by Saint Mesrop Mashtots. Early in the fifth century, very early in the fifth century, um, and uh, tradition has it that he tried very, very hard, and he was going to give up because the task was such a such an onerous one. It was so difficult. But at a time when he was about to give up and he was almost about to fall asleep, he had this dreamlike vision when suddenly God's hand appeared and started drawing the Armenian letters one by one on the wall. And he was sort of transfixed and immediately he found a piece of parchment and he quickly copied the alphabet from the wall. So Armenians say often that God gave them their alphabet. In fact, we must not underestimate the achievement of St. Mesrob Mashtot. Uh, by the way, this is still from the time when I gave these lectures in Czech. So I see that I have Svati Mesrob Mashtot instead of St. Mesrob Mashtot. Allow me quickly to make this correction. Okay, that's better. In fact, it seems very, very, very probable that uh, Saint Mesrop Mashtots borrowed some of the signs, but not the system, the signs for the Armenian letters from a language that is known as Gez. And Gez is Old Ethiopian. And it's very interesting because it consists of consonants onto which you add a vowel. And depending on which vowel you add, uh, you insert a little tail or a little hook or something like that. So you've got many, many, many symbols because this is ha, that is who, that is he, and so forth. That is sa, that is su, that is si. Now, the mechanisms and the structure are completely different from Armenian, nothing to do with Armenian. But some of the shapes are identical to those of the Armenian letters, the majuscule letters, the Yergatakir letters. So it is very likely that Mesrop Mashtots found inspiration in the Gez script. However, this is the Armenian alphabet now. I uh, propose, ladies and gentlemen, that you should make a screenshot of this slide because it's extremely important.
Now, on the left hand side, I have given you the majuscule, the capital letter, or as we say these days, the uppercase letter. So this is R. That's the small one, lowercase of R. So you can see that for many letters, the uppercase is the same as the lowercase. It's bigger and it's higher. It starts on the line, whereas the lowercase is, as it were, usually bisected by the line, the line on which the letters are sitting. But for some letters, they look different. For example, IP, which is the first letter, R, the lowercase is topologically different from the higher, from the uppercase. Um, let's look at the first few. Now, these are in columns, not in rows. So it's IP, PEN, KIM, TA, YECH, ZA, E, ET, TO, ZHE. So it's the first ten letters. If you look at the order of these letters, they are related to the Greek. So, A or IP corresponds to the Greek alpha. Pen corresponds to the Greek vita. Kim corresponds to the Greek gamma. Ta corresponds to the Greek delta and yech corresponds to the Greek epsilon. But of course the Greek alphabet itself is related to uh, Phoenician and Hebrew and if you look at the names of the Armin letters, Ip, Pen, Kim, what does it remind you of? If any of you know the Bible and the Old Testament particularly, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, where each section is preceded by the name of a Jewish letter. So the first letter in the Jewish alphabet is Aleph. Second one is Beth. And the third letter, which is Kim in Armenian, is Gimel in Hebrew. So you see, all these things are related to a greater or lesser degree. Now, one or two other things. This is Lune, and it's a L. As you can see, it's very, very similar to the Latin letter L. The lowercase version of ho, that's the uppercase, this is the consonant he, that looks the same as the lowercase Latin letter he. The letter re, it's not that different topologically from the lowercase r in Latin. These are the last two letters, o and fe. Instead of o, in the past, one would have au. So, we have words automatic, for example, in English, au, or, or dawn in Latin is aurora, au, which is O. So in the past they would use this A followed by this letter which is called Hyun, which is usually translated using the W. So that and that together would be used instead of this O. And instead of F, in the past they would use Pur which in the uppercase is identical, in fact, to 
the Greek phi or phi. So, there are connections. Now, I'll read you the letters. Marek, you are recording, aren't you? Yes? Yeah, thanks. So, Ip is A, this one. Then, Pen, the second letter, this. Kim, Ta, Yech, Za, E, Ut. This is known in linguistics as a Shava. It is a. And it's not like in Czech where it doesn't really have a sound of its own, as in strch, prst, skrs, krk. This is, if you imagine, not strch, it is strch, so it's a. Uh. It is a full vowel, so it's a. Uh. To, je, ini, lun, che, za, gen, ho, za, rad, je, Men, he, which can be year when it is in the middle of a word, read as her when it is in the beginning of a word, and not pronounced in most cases when it is at the end of a word. So this is he, but which is often here. Nu, sha, vo, cha, be, che, ra, se, vev, dun, re, tso, hun, pur, ke, and the last two letters, O and Fe. Now, this is U. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a letter. This is a digraph. It's two letters, which together create an U. I stress this because if any of you have had access to the uh, Soviet era uh, educational system, they teach U as being a letter. And the communists also abolished the Hun. This is a bit of a problem because you cannot write my surname without this letter. And every time I visited Armenia, I've had quarrels with the Armenian Philharmonic Orchestra, I was going to conduct a concert and on a poster they had written my name in a wrong way because they couldn't make sense of it as it is. That's because the communists uh, abolished this letter, basically. So, uh, that, that's the least of my worries. I'm not saying the worst thing to do with the abolition of this letter by the communists is that you can no longer write my name. Uh, there are many other catastrophic things that follow from the removal of the letter from the alphabet. Um, so, yeah. Now, once again, I'll go over it. And now, instead of saying the names of the letters, I will just pronounce the sound. So, A, P, but probably in ancient Armenian, this would sound more like B as it does in Eastern Armenian today. Indeed, in terms of pronunciation, there is evidence to believe that Eastern Armenian pronunciation may have been closer 
to the way in which ancient Armenian was pronounced. Um, so this is k, but it was probably more like g in ancient Armenian, much as is the case in Eastern Armenian now. T, or probably more like the in the past. This is ye, and it is pronounced ye when it is in the beginning of a word, but e when it is in the middle of a word. And there are reasons to suppose that in some places, in some periods, it may have been read as ye even in the middle of a word. But that is not the case now. Z, E, E, T, J, I, L, H. A bit like yeah, a bit like the Greek he, but not quite the same. More like Hebrew, ch, maybe. Z, g, but probably pronounced k in the past. H, tz, but probably pronounced z in the past. R, Pronounced like the French R. J, M, H in the beginning of a word and Y in the middle of a word and usually not sounding at all at the end of a word with a tiny number of exceptions. N, SH, V in the beginning of a word with some exceptions. Otherwise, O, CH, B, but, but probably P in the past, CH now, but J probably in the past, as in Eastern Armenian pronunciation, R, S, V, D, but probably pronounced T, in the past. R, a little different from R. This is more like R. Yeah. Tz. Hun is usually pronounced V, but it forms digraphs. With V it gives U, and with E which is similar to it, except this letter has a little horizontal tail there in the upper case. In the lower case, they are different from each other. So with an E, it forms digraph that is U or U. P, equivalent to the Greek phi, K, or and that digraph is U. Now, let us look at the hübschmann meyer transliteration. So we use an A for A, a B for P, which in the past was probably pronounced like a B as well, a G or a G, for K, for Kim, which was, however, probably pronounced G, so there is a logic. Likewise with Ta and D, probably it does reflect something of the older pronunciation of it. For the Yech, we use this E, and for the E, we use the long E with a horizontal line over it. For za, we use this sign for a z. 
someone has written in the chat. Right, Panchal is leaving. Let's continue to record because he will need to learn this without which he won't be able to follow uh, further lectures. So, we reached E, long E. For the E, uh, we use the international phonetic symbol for E. Uh, so that's easy. For T, we use a T and that breathing sign. It makes sense. For je, we use something that is so natural if you're a Czech person, a Z with a hachek on it, which is also je. So that's easy. Now, for e, we use the Latin I, so that's good, e, e. An L for lune, also very intuitive. For che, we use the X. If you think of the X as being similar looking to the Greek chi, to the Greek he, that also is easy to remember. For za, we use si, which in Czech is tsa, anyway, which is close to the original pronunciation of za, which was pronounced tsa in the past. So that also corresponds. Likewise, k for g, h for ho. This is the one that you need to remember on its own because this is different from what you would expect, say, from Czech. So for tsa, which was probably pronounced z in classical times, we use this j. And from z in going to ch, we just put a ha check over this. Now, for the rad, we use the sign for an L, for the lune, but with a little diagonal line bisecting it. Remember, the rad was often used in Armenian words that derived from the Greek, and where the Greek word or name had a lambda, that l changed into a r in the Armenian. So that can help you remember as we go from L to R, we move from the L to this with the bisecting sign. Now, J is this sign, which is for check Ch. Again, it has a logic, because this probably was Ch in the past. And I believe in East Armenian, someone who sees this pronounces this not as a J, but as a Ch. Inga nods helpfully. Thank you. M with this M, so that's good. This is her in the beginning of a word, and otherwise ya, although in most cases when it is at the very end, we don't pronounce it. And ya, well, this is also a ya, so that's that's good. Nu with an n, that's logical. Sha, well, that's s with a diacritic, just as in Czech, that's sh. For vo, or o in the middle of a word, we've got an o. Whereas for this more modern o, which used to be written as av in the past, we've got the o with the thing over it. For cha, we've got the check ch, but with this breathing sign after it. For be, which used to be pronounced pe, we've got a p. So this is a cha, which, uh, sorry, this is a che, which used to be pronounced j. And so, from Z to J, we move from the J to the J with a hat check on it. Just as we move from a S to a SH by putting a hat check, or from a Z to a J. Likewise, from a Z to a J. So again, there is an analogy. 
for the r, the rolled r, we use a Latin r with a dot or a little thingy on it. And a s is represented by means of an s, and a vev by means of this v. Last column. Dun was probably pronounced t, and is represented by a t. R, unlike r, which had an r with a dot on it or something on it, it's just an r with nothing on it. Tso is a c but with that thing after it to make it distinct from tsa. Hun, which is usually pronounced as a v, is represented by a w. Pur, p, is a p with a breathing mark. K, which is a k, is a k with a breathing mark, an aspiration mark. Long O, an F, and beware, for the U, the hübschmann meyer system uses this letter U, or U in Czech. Uh, it's a digraph, not a letter, but in the hübschmann meyer it's represented by the letter U, not by OU, and not by OW. Okay, this is worth noting. Other than that, the advantage of the hübschmann meyer system is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping and there's perfect reversibility and there's no ambiguity. Anything I can write in Armenian, if I write it in the hübschmann meyer transliteration, I can always know what the Armenian was without any doubt. And that's the important advantage of the hübschmann meyer system. One other thing before I ask you if you have any questions and then we take a break. I have purposely arranged these letters in columns. That's because they have numerical values as well. In other words, Armenian numbers. So in Armenian, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So ja is ten. What's eleven? Eleven is not ini. Ini is twenty. So that's twenty. If I want eleven, I write ja aip. Sorry, je. I, it's J. J, I. So, J, A. Because this is 10, and I put a 1 after it, and that makes 11. That's 20. That's 30. 40. 50. 60. 70. 80. 90. 100. So, J is a hundred. That's two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred. Ra is a thousand. Two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand. And I have to stop there. I don't know how to go up and express higher numbers. So, uh, actually, I realize that given that uh, that's 10, it would be better if I put this at the top of this table. And uh, of this, sorry, I, I take this here and put it there at the top of this column. So that I start with 10. So that that be one to nine, ten, to ninety, a hundred, to 
900, uh, sorry, 900, 1,000 to 9,000. Okay. Hope I haven't confused you with all this. Are you still with me? Okay. Now, uh, we may now put a pause on the recording, please, Marek. Thank you. So, let us return to this hübschmann meyer transliteration table of the Armin alphabet. There are some observations I would like to make. Uh, first of all, we have four parallels that are helpful to us. So, just as in Czech, adding a diacritic sign, a hacek, changes the pronunciation of the letter, so tz becomes a ch, s becomes a sh, z becomes a z. With Armenian, uh, with Hübschmann Meyer for the Armenian alphabet, we also have this second, whereby uh, z becomes j. So uh, that's one thing that simplifies matters. Uh, you see, z is becoming j, and this, which I pronounced z, but it was probably tse, becomes uh, tse. Uh, no, sorry, where, where are we? Uh, I want it with a hatchet. So, uh, there, j, yes. So, so, this would have been ch. So, from tz to ch. For me, from z to j, but you can forget about that. And the easiest one, fortunately, from s to sh. So, that's one thing. There are two signs which we need to remember. One is the R. A hint is to remember that the Armenian R often corresponds to the Greek lambda. So that's a L with a little uh, bisecting uh, diagonal line. And a. Uh. Some people, for convenience, use an e with a hachek for e, uh, but it's not approved by the hübschmann meyer system. So the proper sign is this. But you may come across that to mean e. Uh. Remember the distinction between the v, which is a vev, and this w, which is a hun. So that's respectively this. And this, the long O, which is the new O, which previously was represented by AU or AV. So this, as opposed to this VO. In the past, we would write this by the combination of this with this. I hope you can see my arrow. And that for U, we use the combination of... Uh, we we uh, use this U to represent the combination of those two. So U is not a letter. It consists, it consists of a digraph consisting of the letter Vo and Hun, but for Hübschmann Meyer it is represented by a single letter. Now, U generally sounds as U. So here we have Lur, L and R. Remember, like the Latin L, like the Latin R, Lur. So that's U. An O and a Y 
followed by a consonant, usually sounds an ui followed by the consonant. So we write l, vo, y, s, and this is luis, not lois, meaning light. And this is guis, which means a virgin, written gois. So the vo and the he followed by a consonant almost always results in ui being pronounced. Ini and hun can be iv or u or you. So here it is you, which corresponds to Greek eleos. Um, it's oil. Arun or Aryun, it means blood. But when it is not followed by anything else, it's Iv. So Paniv, it's the instrumental case of Pan. It means through a word or by means of a word. Pan is a word. Pan is the equivalent of the Greek Logos. The vo at the beginning of a word sounds vo, otherwise it sounds as an o in the middle of a word. So we have vorti, which means sun, but the definite accusative is zorti, and because we have the z constant before it, it's not zvorti. So although it is vorti when it is the first letter, when there is a consonant in front of it, it is pronounced O and not VO. So it is ZORTI. But there are some words that start with a VO, but they are not pronounced VO. For example, OV, VO, VEV, we pronounced VO, uh, we pronounced OV and not VOV. Even though in some dialects, people said VOV. My late paternal grandmother, whose family came from uh, uh, Izmir, Zmyrnia, Smyrni in Greek, would say vov and not of. Ye in the beginning of a word sounds ye and we have yes, for example. But when we have a vowel, sorry, I should say here vowel. better. Okay. And an U followed by a vowel sounds as if it were a V and a vowel. So this is written as du wads, but we pronounce it as wads. As I mentioned before, the he, the ye in the beginning of a word, sounds her instead of ye. So we have huis, hamenain. And remember the uis as in guis or luis, the voye and a consonant gives hui. So huis, hamenain. At the end of a word, it is usually mute, so arka, not arkai, arka. But when there's a vowel, uh, well, sorry, when there's a consonant after it, we pronounce the uh, archaic. So king, kings. The k at the end converts it into a plural. And the shava uh, sometimes 
sounds even though it's not written. It may be written explicitly where it's not usually written in poetry and hymns and places where it has to be very, very clear that a syllable has to be devoted to it. So, a slave is a strug. So, an e uh is pronounced before the s and the d and the r. It's not sdrug, nor is it strug. It is a strug. But, I lie, sdem, is pronounced with the latent shava between the s and the d. And in places where no e uh, is usually written, such as deren, yeves, zanunt, in some manuscripts where there's poetry or singing involved, the e uh, is placed explicitly. Deren, two syllables. Yeves, two syllables. Zanunt, two syllables. So, I propose we end at this place. Can we stop the recording, Marco, please?